Okay, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? I want to first thank all of you for attending this event and definitely thanks to our panelists for sharing their insights and spending some time with us to talk about this topic. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So this discussion is called Economic Geology in the COVID-19 Pandemic Impacts on Academia. And as the title suggests, we're talking about how this pandemic has affected university life. So my name's Isaac Simon. I'm the host for today's event. Uh, I'm a member of SEG and one of SEG's group called Early Career Professionals Committee, which is the committee that uh, worked together to bring this event to you today. So the Early Career Professionals Committee is a group of eight members, uh, professionals who are dedicated to essentially bridging the gap between university life and academia life through, uh, through uh, events and uh, services that can, that can essentially help uh, university students, graduates, uh, recent graduates help transition to this. Uh, our committee is, is working towards helping out uh, recent, recent graduates transition to the early career life. So if you have any questions at all and you want to know more, we've included the website here on the SEG website and also an email address for you to contact in case you have any questions and wanna reach out. So let's go on to the actual event today. So here we have the panelists today. So again, I'm the host and I won't be sharing any of my insights, but rather asking these intelligent professionals what their experiences are. So we have Murray Hitzman, Hannah Hughes, Irena Del Real, and Katharina Frau. So how the flow of this event will be is that we have four general questions of general topics that we wanna cover. And I'll be asking these questions to each of these panelists so that they can share their insights. Uh, at the end of each topic, we'll try to sprinkle in some of the audience questions if they're relevant to the, to the, uh, to the discussion. And, but if we don't have time, then what we'll do is what we have set up is a Q&A session at the end of this discussion. So 30 minutes at the end of our discussion will be dedicated to Q&A. So uh, go ahead and submit your questions in the Q&A box. So that Q&A box will be found at your control bar. So go ahead and click that Q&A. Uh, submit your questions and we will do our best to get through all of them. If there are too many questions, I'll apologize ahead, uh, ahead of time and let you know that we might not get through all of them, but we strongly encourage you to, to submit a question so that we have a great discussion going. So lastly, I just wanna let you all know that we did have a similar event, uh, a similar live panel event uh, occur uh, yesterday evening mountain time and that was consisting of panelists that were in industry as opposed to our panel of academia professionals. So go ahead and check that event out once it's available on the SEG website and the YouTube channel. Um, it, was, it was a great event hosted by a, a colleague of mine, Tim McIntyre who did a great job hosting and our panelists shared great insights on exploration, junior and major level as well as mining sector and the consulting region. So um, the consulting uh, expertise as well were shared. So go ahead and check that out once it's available. And what we'll do before getting started with our panelists introducing themselves is we'll activate a poll so that you all can participate in. Give us a moment as we get that poll going. Here we go. Just give everybody some time to make sure they can answer this question and then we can show those results.
looks like a majority of our attendees and panelists have attend or have not attended a virtual field trip. And then those who have generally found it a good experience, absolutely, and somewhat being the dominant answers. Of course, there's room for improvement. So maybe that's something to take into account for our industry, especially since uh, we don't know when the end of COVID is, and we may be relying on these virtual field trips to, to learn more about geology of other countries and other regions we can't get to at this time. Yeah, thanks everybody for participating in that. So, I'll go ahead and get started with our panelists. And how about we have Murray Hitzman go ahead and introduce himself. Well, hello everyone, thanks for attending. Uh, my name is Murray Hitzman. I'm a professor at University College Dublin and director of the IRIS Center for Research uh, in Applied Geoscience. Um, I have a checkered career. I started off in industry in the petroleum sector, then into uh, the mining sector and ended up working pretty much all around the world on different mining and exploration projects. Went into the US government for a while, I worked in the US Senate at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy on Natural Resources. Then went to Colorado School of Mines, 20 years as a professor there, working with fantastic uh, other professionals and students from all around the world uh, and on projects all around the world. Back to the government, USGS, and now back to academia here in Ireland. Thanks, Isaac. <laughs> what a great uh, history in geology, Murray. How about Irene? Would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Irene El Real. Um, thank you so much for the invitation and for everybody attending. I'm a postdoc researcher right now at the University of Chile in Santiago of Chile. I'm an undergrad. I, and I did my undergrad here also, so I'm back to my, um, my alma mater, how they call it. <laughs> Uh, I, after finishing my geology degree, I worked a little bit in exploration and also um, I did some work on regional mapping for some projects for the geological survey, which was a great experience in the middle of nowhere. After that, I traveled to Canada, to Vancouver and did a master's with the MDRU where I focused on um, copper molly and copper gold porphyries. And finishing that, I went up to the US to uh, Cornell University where I did a, a PhD in the Candelaria IOCG district with John Thompson. And right now I'm working still on the world of IOCG especially, and I'm also teaching at university. So a mix between research and teaching. Thanks for sharing. How about Hannah, would you mind introducing yourself? No worries. Thanks, Isaac. And thanks to the SEG for putting on this discussion. Um, and thanks for you guys for attending. Uh, my name is Hannah Hughes. I'm a senior lecturer in exploration and mining geology at the Campbell School of Mines, which is part of the University of Exeter in uh, the UK. Um, so yeah, most of my education was uh, in terms of undergraduate and uh, MSc and PhD was all within the UK. Um, but then I eventually went off and did a postdoc at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, and then ultimately, um, as Irina puts it, put, came back to the, one of the places I was educated, which is Campbell School of Mines, of course. So uh, I teach actively on undergraduate and postgraduate MSc courses alongside PhD research. Uh, and that ranges from uh, things like underground mapping, um, uh, field mapping and field trips, GIS or geographical information systems, but also various things around geochemistry, igneous petrology, and of course, economic geology as well. That's me. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Kind of last. All right. Uh, so, okay, my name is Katja Foth. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for attending. Um, I'm a research associate professor at the Colorado School of Mines and I run and oversee the min mineral and materials characterization facility here. Uh, in the Department of Geology and Geological Engineering. Um, our lab houses light microscopes, electron microscopes, and XRF-based systems, and we're really, you know, actively engaged in methods development for automated mineralogy, you know, with, at a wide variety of applications. Um, I teach reflected light in electron microscopy classes, I teach uh, XRF methods and uh, igneous petrology, and I'm currently advising seven graduate students. Um, our research focuses on fundamental and applied research related to economic geology from early exploration through mining 
and the sustainable use of earth resource materials such as tailings, you know, by combining traditional field work with modern microanalytical and machine learning techniques. So they're really starting to venture out in these, um, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Obviously, an emerging and not new, but it definitely has a larger interest now. Emerging research field focuses on the residence of critical minerals. Uh, we are currently focused on rare earth elements, germanium, cobalt, but also other critical minerals in a variety of deposit types. All right, thanks for sharing. So as you, as everybody can tell, we have a great variety of backgrounds here from ranging different countries, commodities, deposit types, research. We just have a great mix of experience. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say to our questions. So that being said, let's roll on to the first one. So this one is regarding health and morale. So the question is, how has pandemic, this pandemic affected the morale of professors and students? What kind of changes have the university taken to ensure everybody's safety from COVID-19? So how about let's have a Kata start off and maybe you can give us some insight even uh, as a lab manager, uh, let us know what what was going on over there? Yes, of course. Well, we kind of experienced yeah, different stages uh, during the pandemic so far, um, at least here in Colorado and the US, we were shut down entirely between mid-March and the end of May, approximately. So that was tough. I think that was tough for everybody. Um, I'm running a lab, my students all work in a lab and in general for students. Uh, we had to finish out the semester completely and entirely remote um, at a moment's notice. I do think all overall, everybody pulled together and we, yeah, we made it work, but it was tough. Um, thesis pro progress, classes, everything online and in insecure, unknown situation. So I, I do think that took a toll. And um, I did listen to yesterday's industry panel and it was pointed out that the youngest age group actually suffered the most from this new situation, right? Because younger people tend to still live, you know, or not still, but live by themselves. And they're just in the process of establishing their lives. They don't have a family yet necessarily. Uh, whereas, uh, yeah, once you're a little further along in, in, in life and your career, it's, you're more likely to have a home with a family. So, um, I do, did feel like our young, yeah, our younger, the students and younger faculty members yeah, were hit harder. Once we were able to come back, at least slowly in June, I think at least everybody who was able to come back, morale was great. Everybody who was able to come back was very excited to be back. Um, the school, the department heads, and all the individuals uh, put in a lot of effort at work trying to make sure that everybody is safe. Uh, we, you know, we have occupancy assignments in the room, so we are able to keep you know, the, the required distance, the university sewed masks, so great um, measures were put into place. Um, but then again, it really depended on who the people are. At the beginning of the new semester in, in August, I do think our freshmen and also first year graduate students, that was really not easy when you come to a new school and you really have a hard time meeting people. Everything is online. On the flip side, graduate students who are working on, on their thesis project in labs and are more able to come to work, you know, it was much easier and everybody was very excited to be able to be back and absolutely willing to, you know, follow everything that was put in place. So it really depended, I think, or depends on who you're who you're looking at. And the last thing I want to point out, um, while everybody's trying to do yeah, what, what needs to be done, students or also faculty who were in a situation that they were found out that they were in close contact with a positive, um, you know, confirmed positive, that was tough until they got that test result back that was hopefully negative. So, you know, and in their shared apartment or whatever, uh, that, was, that was tough on folks. Yeah, I'm sure it's a scary experience knowing somebody that you work closely with. Um, you could have contracted, you could have contracted something from there. Uh, thanks for sharing that, uh, Eden. And do you have any insights? Uh, you also teach some courses. Uh, 
maybe you can let us know about that. Yes, um, actually it's been quite tough here. Uh, we had a very, very strict lockdown where we could only let, leave the house for uh, just twice a week for a couple of hours. And it got really bad here in Santiago, the whole COVID situation. So in that sense for the students, is the morale was very low and it's just starting to get a little bit better. But now the whole country is waiting for the second COVID wave. So everybody's sort of like scared. And yeah, we, I'm like teaching wise, it was okay for me, like for us professors to teach when it wasn't a field course or a lab course. But, and also it was very difficult because at the beginning we really didn't know how long the whole situation was going to be. So all the speculation was that, you know, in June we'll, we'll be back at university, September, October, and now it's maybe March. So the university is still mainly closed. Some students can go there now maybe to use, you know, the microscope. The labs are little by little starting to open, but basically most of it is all shut down. So it has been quite a challenge um, for the students. It's very frustrating, especially um, I teach a, a field course this semester and we can't go to the field and there's no way we're going to go to the field maybe until March because there hasn't been any field trips since uh, spring 2019 because we had a very strong social outbreak here. So the whole country was on strike for several months and they had to cancel all the field, all the field work and like for students during from at least October on of last year. So there's at least three semesters on like on queue waiting for field for their field work for the field trip. So it's very complicated and we're just hoping to start going to the field with the students. But they understand. They actually they really understand well and they see that you know we are doing our best effort to also make these virtual classes more interesting. Um, I personally try and bring speakers that are not here in Santiago and kind of like, you know, have talks that are a little bit like out of a, our specific topic, but, you know, have researchers give talks through Zoom. And I think that has been like a really interesting resource and that has make, made, you know, a little bit more fun so they can have like these specialized talks and, you know, you can enjoy that at least. So in that sense, and the other part that is really has been a, a tricky here is that, you know, not everybody has connectivity. Um, and here's a real problem. You know, you have students that actually, you know, don't have internet or Wi-Fi in their house and they have to connect through their cell phone. Um, then they don't have data from their, with their cell phone and they just can't attend class. So in that sense, the university, you know, they did an effort and they send out SIM cards to these students so they could have at least connect with their phone. But then there was issues if they were receiving the SIM cards or not. So actually last semester, there was an online strike. So students wouldn't go to their online classes, which also, you know, the semester got pretty delayed in that sense. So yeah, it has been a challenge, I would say, you know, it's also has been kind of, you know, there has been a lot of more conversation between students and professors, like more personal conversations, checking how the students are, ask them if they have any emotional problems, tell them, you know, if you don't feel okay, just send us an email, you'd be in like very open mind and open heart to understand our students. So in that sense, I think that has been nice, kind of like a more, more maybe more complex relationship with our students. But yeah, so surviving and just, you know, hoping that maybe next, you know, the term finishes here at the end of this month, we are Southern Hemisphere and we come back on March. So I don't know, just, you know, everybody's hoping that in March, at least some people will be vaccinated and we'll all be able to go to university again, but it's still a question. Right, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And thanks for touching on that point about uh, some students not having the same opportunities as far as having internet and maybe a laptop that runs better than others. So I think that's a pretty solid issue that universities should consider. And it sounds like Universidad de Concepcion in Chile did, did, uh, did that right by providing SIM cards or at least trying to make it easier in that mind. Uh, how about Hannah? Could you provide your perspectives from Kimborn School of Mines? Yeah, of course. Um, I think what uh, Cara and Irene have already pointed out is, is spot on, in, uh, and that is that it, it really depends on who you're talking about in terms of where they're at in their studies and in their career, but also where they are geographically as well. And, you know, Irene hits a, a chord there in terms of I'm also aware of my 
colleagues and ex-colleagues um, in South Africa having to deal with very similar issues. And I think that becomes quite a, a, a big stumbling point in terms of the way that we're delivering. But even actually within the UK, we see that there's a discrepancy between what some students have access to and what other students have access to. So for example, where I'm at at Campbell School of Mines within Cornwall, which is in the far southwest of England, and it's a very rural area, and the university that we're, that we're part of is the University of Exeter, so that's Devon, which is the next county over, it's still very rural. And in terms of the infrastructure that we have from a Wi-Fi perspective, it's a huge discrepancy still, even in somewhere like the UK. So for example, you know, you were saying your students really have to connect on 4G. I have to regularly do that when I deliver my lectures sometimes because my quite rural broadband connection just cannot cope for a lot of the time. So if I drop off, you know what that's about. So there's challenges on both sides, both from the students and also from the lecturer side, I think in terms of delivering a lot of this, particularly when it comes to pre-recorded lectures, which are often massive file sizes and require an awful lot of work to go into. But on the plus side, I think there are so many positives that have come out of this change in the way that we deliver. And certainly speaking from where, where we're at here, we've really put a, a, a lot of emphasis on a blended approach to learning. So this is where we have a lot of online stuff that we pre-record and we develop in advance. And where we also carry that up, you know, match that up with, with live and synchronous sessions like this. And where, you know, if the internet drops out, it's not the end of the world, we can still pick up on things on a live issue or do certain things live, but we've also got the backup of the pre-recorded session. And so from an inclusivity point of view, in terms of how individual students learn or prefer to learn, I think there's actually a silver lining to all of this in terms of how we deliver our courses globally, as you know, in terms of how a lot of universities have looked to do this. And that also carries through, I think, for field work. So, you know, just in terms of an example, we've had several virtual field trips that we've had to conduct. Um, just because, in fact, when the first lockdown for us came in, it was within a few days of us really needing to run a field trip up in Scotland, for example, that I was involved with. And so all of a sudden we had to change to being entirely online. And, and that was a massive turnaround in terms of what was achieved. And I think it was a really successful trip. But I think also because of the turnaround, naturally, there was a lot of things that we could learn and, and do differently and subsequently have brought in. And one of those things, um, and actually we'll be testing this out nearly next week, is to actually have a blended field course as well, where you can have students who feel comfortable or able to come into the field. We're very lucky that we have a strong mining heritage around us and so we've got lots of places we can visit within a few minutes drive. But also those students who cannot attend because they're shielding or you know, maybe they're studying remotely, which has also been an option for a lot of students in the UK at the moment, so they physically don't have to come to the university, they can study remotely. But they can also attend that field course via a GoPro video or a phone video on a 4G network or just their, their colleagues here in the field if they're operating as a team calling them throughout the day and, and being able to share information and vice versa those people who are attending virtually can provide them with lots of literature and aerial photographs and all sorts of intelligence if you will from, from various virtual things so I don't know if it necessarily answers the point about health and morale, but I think all of these things taken into consideration mean that we see an increase in an anxiety from our students, but also from the staff that are lecturing them. But as I said before, the silver lining is that because we've had to adapt in terms of flexibility, that that, that I think is the really big positive thing to come out of this, from, certainly from an inclusivity point of view. One of the big challenges for me next term, running on a Northern Hemisphere academic year, is that I would normally run underground, my, um, underground mapping for our mining students. And in, in terms of ventilation and physical social distancing and all that, that's going to be a massive challenge. So if we're allowed to go ahead with it, great. But I suspect we're still going to be in a position where we can't. And so it will be very interesting to see how we can develop an alternative <coughs> to that as well. Um, so that's going to be quite a challenge. <laughs> Watch this space, I think. A gaming platform may be something that we have to look into. Right, thanks for, for sharing your insights on that. Uh, Murray, would you mind uh, sharing your, your perspective as an ICRAG director, as the ICRAG Sure, um, almost all the things that, that the other three have mentioned, you know, I would concur with. Uh, one difference it sounds like with, with our institution with some of the others is we have been back in the field and we actually have done field, real field trips. Um, they've been highly, um, very well, very, very well organized 
and spaced and you know all sorts of precautions that we never ever took before. They're for small groups. Ireland is a small island, um, so we don't have very far to go for many of the trips. Um, but we have managed to get out in the field successfully and you know pulled it off, um, which has been great. However, I think that has actually hurt us in the sense that we haven't gone down the road as far as Camborn obviously have with doing the virtual trips, um, which I think is the future actually, or is part of our future um, because it gives us access to the whole planet, um, which again, being a small island <laughs> would be really great for us to be able to do. So, um, you know, I, I see pluses and minuses. As to myself, I haven't been to my office since mid-March. Right? I literally have not been to my office. Now, I have been in the field with students, with my, some of my research students, um, to core sheds <laughs> and to a couple of outcrops and to quarries, um, but I haven't been into school, the actual physical school. Um, like the others, our, our labs and school was basically closed down, almost really locked down for two months. And then our labs opened up, they are open, um, but again, because of all the precautions, uh, the amount of work getting done is, is not even 50% of what it was before, um, because we just have fewer people in, um, cleaning up between, you know, all the different preca precautions we're taking, um, which all are, you know, need to be done. So, so the amount of lab work we're getting done is low. One of the interesting things I've had with my students, so I'm primarily doing research these days. And I have uh, one PhD student who, who I knew before she was supposed to come. She's from Namibia and um, she isn't here yet, all right? We haven't been able to actually get her from Namibia to Ireland. Um, she's already basically had a semester and a bit with us. <laughs> she's doing her field work. Uh, I Zoom with her at the location at the mine she's working at, you know, weekly. But it's a bit weird. It's good that I knew her before, you know, she actually was accepted. I knew her when she was doing her master's with someone else. Um, I have another student, <laughs> PhD, a postdoc, who I really didn't know beforehand, who is in Ireland, and I physically have not met her yet, even though, again, she's been with us for a semester and is doing great work, <laughs> right? And I virtually am working with her in a lab. I mean, she's on a Zoom and She's with equipment and I'm seeing what she's seeing, da, da, da. It's going well, but it's just really weird that I actually haven't physically been in a room with her. <laughs> so there's all sorts of funny things that are coming out of this last year, which, how would I put it? They're all a bit weird. Some of them, though, I think are really going to change us for the better, despite it all. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Murray. Thanks for ending with the positive note there. Saying it's all for the better. Uh, so let's move on to our next topic. That would be uh, financial situation. So the question is, how has the pandemic affected the financial situation of your university or institution? Uh, I'd like to start off with Irene here. I correct me if I'm wrong, but I I have this idea that postdocs spend a lot of time doing grant proposals and looking for funding. Is is that something you do? Is that an issue with the pandemic? Uh Yes, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm like the opposite of Murray, a lot of negative stuff, but no, here has been a, a, quite a big issue. Um, so this year for all the grants, it was as normal because the budget is, you know, established the year before, but next year is going to be an issue because the government cut a lot of budget for research and science and also for public universities here because the country is going through a really, you know, a very well, the whole world, but here like, there's a very strong economic recession. So most of the government funds are going to other, like the priority has changed for them. So in that sense, I think next year is gonna hit researchers pretty strongly because over here, um, most researchers have to apply for um, funding from, you know, the, the, the government or the state. And, you know, and as it is in, in most countries, but, you know, different from, for example, my experience that I had in, in Vancouver with the, MD, with the mineral research unit, here in Chile, there's still not that, a, such a strong connection between industry and research, especially like in the world of economic geology. And <clears throat> at least I think for our field, it, it should be possible to work more that option if you know, our funding is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be less next year. 
So, but yeah, and, and the other thing is for the students, because of this economic recession, lots of students, like their, their parents have lost their jobs. So there's a lot of, you know, stress and anxiety associated to that. Um, people are constantly just, you know, asking for jobs for anything on the web. So it's like on the internet and Twitter, anywhere. So it's, it has been quite, quite hard and I'm pretty sure it's gonna get better. And it's slowly, you know, already starting to get better but also the, the country is quite you know uneasy at this moment because there has been a lot of changes not only around covid but also you know in our society because of all the protests that have been has been happening here for the last year uh, but yeah so i'm not really sure what's going to happen next year i think probably the future looks um, more like we're going to start getting closer to the industry i think that's a, a really good idea and that's something that could be way better over here, at least for economic geology. And in terms of funding, you know, just wait. Maybe next year it's going to be the only bad year, and then the budget will come back to normal. But even our international scholarship program was um, shut down for masters this year. So, and in that sense, you know, the um, the state is trying to make, you know, internal research like within the country stronger. But they just cut budget everywhere. So complicated so please the next person could be maybe be more positive <laughs> yeah no no worries thanks for sharing that i think i think it's important to be honest as well so uh go ahead i will let's let's see let's have kata share her insights on financial situation and maybe as a lab manager talk about some of uh what's been going on as far as external clients that you you typically would have had so yeah, in terms of financial situation, obviously we have different aspects, right? So there's the university level, um, there's the lab level, and then there's funding for students and research and those kind of things. And uh, those different aspects or levels within the university uh, have been impacted differently. So the university as a whole um, really you know, figured out what the different scenarios might be in terms of student enrollment and, and what's what's happening uh, due to the travel restrictions, um, you know, international students, we have some remote international students as well, and that is being made possible. But we definitely have less international students. Uh, good news for the university, um, general student enrollment has been fairly stable. Um, that is a good thing from, a, you know, just to be able to maintain classes and everything. Uh, in terms of the lab, um, we were shut down for three months. Obviously, that is not good, not a good thing. Um, we did not um, generate any income for three months. We did not generate any data for three months. Also, not for students and student projects. On the flip side, I know other labs worldwide, you know, hit way harder than we, we are. So we were able to go back and come back to work. Um, individually, socially distanced with precautions, but um, I was back at work, physically at work at the beginning of June. Um, we have less industry jobs. Um, there's definitely you know, less field work. On the flip side, we have actually an increase in research projects we're working on. And that's because there are many ongoing research projects and researchers were not able to go to the field and do additional field work. And all of a sudden there was a budget, a line item in their budget that then they were able to spend on additional analytical you know, things. So they actually ended up submitting more, more samples you know, to the labs that are actually available and open. So in terms of uh, volume, we, we're, we're fully booked. Um, the, the breakdown has changed a little bit between you know, research and industry, commercial work versus more you know, research uh, questions, but really because you know, with the lack of field work and you know, that being budgeted for, there was additional funding in ongoing research projects. Um, obviously it has impacted student projects. You know, student projects that were heavy on field work had to be canceled. Um, we, were in a, we were in a very lucky or good situation that we were able to change student projects, but obviously that has an impact on funding. And the other thing that really impacts student project funding is that with the situation, student progress is slower, right? Um, not all you know, labs are open, field work may be delayed or not possible. 
um, working at home all of a sudden eight hours a day is a real change and it takes some getting used to. So just student project is slower. Therefore, the original timeline cannot be met for various reasons, right? It's nobody's fault. But obviously, students are at risk to run out of funding before they're actually able to finish their project. Yeah, those are some great points, especially that, that one about getting more lab work because people had to cross out the field work that they typically would have been able to. I didn't even think about that. Thanks for sharing all that. Hannah, do you mind uh, chiming in here with some of your, some of your thoughts? Yeah, no worries. Um, I agree, uh, I think, with uh, both uh, Marina and, and Katara again, in terms of, um, I think overall international students are probably down um, from a university-wide sector in the UK perspective. Um, I think from our School of Mines perspective, I think things have balanced out. So I don't think we've seen a massive change there, but I know that on the wider sector, we've seen a big change because people just, they aren't able to move or they feel less confident to move across whether that be an undergraduate or postgraduate or you know, PhD level, for example. Uh, what Murray described in terms of his PhD student strikes a chord as well, um, because I think that's, uh, that's pretty commonplace. And I think coming back to the first question, actually, in terms of morale, um, that actually has some big implications for how people feel that they are or are not, perhaps in some cases, part of an institution or a university or a research group. And so I think that is a negative to have come out of all of this in terms of whilst Teams and Zoom and whatnot have enabled us to, to work from home and perhaps again be a bit more um, inclusive in terms of our working style around families or whatever, that, um, that, uh, that, that comes at a cost in terms of a, a feeling of belonging. And, and I think that also then comes at a, at a cost in terms of um, which students or which groups of students are more or less likely to go to a certain university in a certain place according to how far away it is. And, and so that has a financial implication. Um, when it comes to labs, yeah, we're in a very similar um, perspective or, or position, I suppose, that uh, the kind of um, um, outline there, which is, you know, basically our labs closed down for several months, so nothing really got done. Then they opened up over the, our Northern Hemisphere summer, and, and so that was great, you know, we could get some, some stuff through. I think for PhD students, though, the, it's not always the case that they're going to be analysing everything within their home laboratory more likely from our perspective that they're also going to be going out and collaborating with other labs whether that be you know within the UK or internationally and so I think that has had a massive impact in terms of what can you get done and actually financially it may be a positive because those funds are effectively left unspent and so as long as the students are able or you know us as researchers are able to access them at a later date so effectively you just delay the end of a grant or end of a PhD that in itself is, is not going to have an adverse effect. However, there are signs that actually being able to put a pause on research projects and, and basically put a pause on, on that funding and just move it a bit later down the line is perhaps not always realistic, particularly for some PhD students. Um, we found uh, there was a recent announcement from the UK Research um, Institute, so UKRI, um, in terms of how funding is distributed around some of the government-funded PhDs. And there's a little bit of a sense now of a hard cutoff in terms of, well, we'll fund you a bit extra for a certain period, but other than that, then we're going to stop now. And so I think there may actually be an, a, a, some hard times coming up for particularly re research students, I think, um, certainly from what I'm seeing within the UK uh, over the next six months to a year or so. And really, it's the students who are in their third year from the way we run our PhDs. That are going to have the biggest difficulties I think. Earlier students perhaps they're early enough and they can do something about it. The students who are really you know at the very end of their PhD writing up and have collected all their data it, it, it's, it's unfortunate but it probably doesn't have a massive impact. It's that funding that for those, those students that are just about in the third year now that that's the real danger zone I think and so I think in terms of financial situation I'm not entirely sure how we fix this, but it is a red flag in terms of something to be aware of uh, and something rather tricky. Um, the last point I would like to make is about um, the role of learned societies like the SEG and, and, you know, I sit on the Mineralogical Society and various committees for that. And of course, there's lots of bursaries that go out to students and also early career researchers more generally in terms of postdocs or whatever. And those are often things for specific lab work or analyses and also specific field 
trips or field work as well. And the difficulty is, I think, over the last few months is that those funds have effectively been awarded but not spent. And so, it, again, you enter this situation of can that money be rolled over? If it can't be rolled over, then those students need to be um, in some way um, acknowledged for having won the bursary or the grant. And that kudos still awarded, even if it means that they can't actually do the thing that they wanted to do. The best solution maybe is if, if that fund can actually, if it does fit in with their timeline, then it can be rolled over and they can still access it. So when it comes to financial situations, I think learning societies also have a, a role to play here in terms of how that is acknowledged for individual students and therefore towards their overall CV building as well. Thanks. Yeah, those are some great points. It's pretty uh, scary to think about PhD students in their later, in their later years being strongly affected by this as well. Uh, Murray, do you think you can provide your perspectives on this? Yeah, I'm very happy Hannah brought that up about different groups like the SEG and, and others in terms of awards and money. And, and the other thing that some of the learning society should think about is in this very unusual couple of years, maybe changing the rules a bit um, so that the money can be spent in other ways, which may be more helpful to the student. Here in Ireland, uh, the government has made provision to try and get uh, researchers, and by that in this country they mean primarily PhDs and postdocs, to, to get the money uh, if they were impacted by the COVID, to get the money to extend them for some period of time, several months. Um, the people it's going to work out best for are those that really were right near the end, <laughs> and you know, one or two months is going to make a big difference and really will help. Uh, as Hannah said, again, the ones who are going to get hurt are the ones that were sort of in their third year, in some places second. Uh, we have a number of students who started just as the pandemic came on and they were doing field work. It was supposed to be at least two years, two field seasons to get the data for environmental projects specifically. And there's no way they're going to be able to do it. It's just not possible now. Um, so we are trying to figure out how the devil we get those people through. And we don't have a simple answer yet. Um, because the government isn't going to cut, you know, they're not going to cover that far for those for that cadre of students. So we're trying to see if we can get money from other places. So, so there are going to be losers. So that, you know, when Arena said, I'm all, everything's happy. No, it's not. <laughs> There's, there's some real bummers out there too. The other thing I'm concerned about, um, and this will take a while before we know how it plays out. Uh, I was very lucky in my graduate career at Stanford. I went through with a unbelievable cadre of people at the time, many of whom you've heard of because they're all famous professors all over the place and written all these papers. Um, and it obviously affected me in my career and you know, it was, was amazing. And part of that, a large part of that, and I'm sure all the other panelists would agree, being a graduate student, is not just having access to the world's most cutting edge equipment that CAFA has and you know, blah, 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 but it's, it's basically it, it, late at night running into them and saying, gee, you know, the professor assigned this problem and I don't know how the hell to do it. How do you do it, right? And <laughs> then going out for a beer on Friday and just talking and, and just basically bouncing ideas off of. And while Zoom is great, and it is, uh, it doesn't do that. And so I worry about cadres of, of graduates, especially at institutions like Colorado School of Mines, Camborne, University of Santiago, Chile, you know, I mean, places with groups of economic geology students here too, um, that they're not able to interact among each other. I mean, I interact you know, every week with each of my students for a couple of hours, and that's great. It's fantastic. We've tried once or twice to do things where we get them all together on Zoom, and that doesn't work so well, right? Really. I mean, it's okay, <laughs> but it's not the same. So I think there's going to be, if you want to call, you know, a generation, a couple of years of, of a graduate cadres coming through schools that will have lost something very significant. So thanks. Yeah. yeah, I love that you ended on that note because something that I often feel grateful for about going to Colorado School of Mines is having met 
people in my classes that later on became my NGOs at, at Barrick, at Newmon, at, they just become your whole network. So something like that that you're missing out on does seem like a great downfall in these times. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to the next topic now. It's regarding research. So how has your research been impacted by the pandemic? Why don't you go ahead and start us off, Marie? Oh, I mean, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, my personal research is in Southern Africa and I haven't been there in a year and a half, right? Um, yesterday, I spent three hours going through a drill hole with some people from down there and we walked through the images of the drill core, you know, box by box by box. And I was okay. You know, I mean, I sort of knew what was going on, um, but it isn't the same, right? So, so just in terms of, of that, um, it's impacted the research in, in huge ways, both financial, uh, technical. I can't get on the machines like Katya's and actually sit on the machine and do it myself. My students do, and they work with people like Katya, and that's great. But, you know, it, it was always good when I could sit there too and we could bounce questions among three or four of us. Um, that we can't do. So, so again, we're doing research and, and, you know, I think it's good research and I'm sure all the universities are, um, but it's harder. And it's not as satisfying. Sitting at home and doing this is not the same as you know, me being in Kitwe and having a great Indian meal at the place I love. And then, you know, after a day spent walking through the bush and, you know, being on the drill rig and talking to the guys in the mine and it's just not the same, right? <laughs> so, so it's a whole different experience. Um, and again, it's worse for the students than for me, All right? So I have one postdoc who's working in that, we're working in Africa, quote unquote, um, who's never been there, right? And it's conceivable they will finish their postdoc without ever getting to the field. Now, they'll, they'll probably do a very nice piece of, of science, but they will have missed, a few, you know, one of the main things I wanted them to get out of the postdoc. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there's, there's some real downsides here. Thank you. Yeah, going back to when I was a grass, and I, I remember there was something really amazing when you pitch an idea to your advisor and your advisor is like yeah that sounds legitimate and i feel like students right now are missing out on that if they're not working side by side with them in a lab for example uh kata how, what are your insights on this topic yeah similar um obviously no travel doesn't yeah if you can't travel it's really hard to initiate new projects um certain things yeah. just can't be done you know some are just canceled some things are postponed we definitely had to change you know research projects ongoing things research projects uh, we had two projects uh that were greenfield exploration in mexico you know we did one field season field stint that you can't there's nothing one can do about it so we switched gears and all the research projects that are being established right now are all picked and like a huge sudden new huge um, consideration is what can we do right so all of a sudden you can't um, think of research questions and approaches in a way okay what is like really the best way to go about it but all of a sudden you have this additional um, you now problem of what can we do what is feasible and then in terms of my it's like while we for student research i think we're you know things you know it's not ideal really not but i think it's moving along i'm a lot busier than i've ever been um i hire i even hired new help because we are now doing a lot of the analyses right the students might come in and join but with yeah, you know, always trying to bear in mind not you know, yeah, be socially distanced and be mindful and not have the rooms too crowded. We do now a lot of the analyses, data reduction, exporting. So I'm a lot more involved in all of the research projects, and I'm you know usually involved as well. Like, but more on a hey, we talk about this and we discuss it and we sit together. Now it's kind of me sitting there in front of the instrument and and the computer and my yeah technical support person so 
yeah, it's definitely changed a lot. And the students don't get the hands, the same hands on experience, right? Before they would do all those things themselves and they can actually, you know, say, I have done this. I, I know the data, I know or the mm, might be. All this is not really an option right now. Right. It sounds like your students at the very least do have the benefit of working on that stuff when they work on other people's projects for them or whoever you hired, they'll at least be able to work on that. But if it's, if it's a student and it's their project and they're not doing the SEM work themselves, for example, might be yeah, a bummer. So some things they do themselves, SEM work, they still do themselves. Okay. Um, other things that are a little more complex and involved, we're just doing a lot more. Okay. All right, Irene, how about your, your perspective? Um, I, mean, I think it's been mostly hard for the students. Um, I also know early um, researchers that, you know, weren't be, they weren't able to collect their data before all of this started to happen. Um, personally, I was very lucky because I had just gone through a season of collecting data. So basically the pandemic just sat me down and made me write the paper. And, and now I'm starting a new project and it looks like I will be able to go to the field to collect more samples. So, you know, personally, it hasn't affected me so much because, you know, there's always something to do. There's always space to rewrite the paper that was rejected two years ago and kind of like give it another try, et cetera. Uh, but for the students, it's more difficult, especially for master students, because, you know, they have two years, at least here. So, you know, they're already like, there's one whole year where they can't, start their project properly or go to the field or collect samples, use the labs. So I think for them, that's the, the hardest, you know, the hardest part. Or students that, you know, needed th that last batch of samples to run them through the laser ablation ICPMS and to graduate and finish their thesis and they're still waiting. So I think in that sense for students, it's quite difficult. There is, here our lab has been completely closed and like the SEM has is closed and they're just starting to open the laser ablation ICPMS. But you know the protocols are really strict, and I, I understand that part like kind of. Um, and there's a really long queue of students that are desperate to get their data. Uh, so yeah, so I think for students it's it's pretty hard, and especially because for them, as as Kata was mentioned, it's very important for them to have you know that hands-on you know time with those machines and you know in the lab or in the field, etc. Uh, but, you know, there's some other options that are happening now, um, you know, I know at least two cases and I'm going to do this in the future that uh, you work in the lab remotely. So, for example, I need to analyze some day, some um, some samples and I'm going to be working remotely, like being participating, like very actively when they do that in a lab in Maine. Um, in the US and I'm not going to be moving from the same, you know, place where I've been sitting here for the last, you know, 10 months. So I think that's that's very interesting and is also, you know, probably an option that can maintain with time. It's always, I mean, always the best option is gonna go, is gonna be to go to the lab and work there. But you know, this intermediate option between just sending your samples and goodbye, and but instead of that being there remotely or on through the internet, I think that's good. You know, that opened the doors for future possibilities. Sometimes, you know. Traveling to the lab can be very expensive, so people prefer not to be that involved because you know it's more cost. So I think, I think you know we're we're innovating in a lot of things because of this pandem yeah. pandemic, and and that, those, innovation, that innovation I think is going to be very useful for the future. But yeah, so I but think, yeah, so I think in at least in um in our case, in our case, I think the students think are students are getting you know it's more hard, more with hard, this, more hard especially, hard, especially hard, those that you know waiting for data or just start their masters, etc. Hopefully, you know, I think the labs are starting to open up is a, is a very good sign here. Sounds good. Thanks for sharing. Got a little rough on my end here with part of what you were saying, but everything was still, uh, I could still understand what you're saying. I thought maybe it was a construction that may, may have been going on in your home, but it's not. I mean, there's also construction here, so okay. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> Hannah, do you mind uh, chiming in here? Yeah, of course. Um, I think this is a really interesting question because for me, the research is where I think I see the biggest discrepancies between individuals according to their 
particular project or their particular um, stage in their career. Um, so whereas before you were talking about kind of big groups of people according to undergraduate or postgraduate and maybe where they were geographically, so rural versus urban areas for us is a massive difference. Um, I think I mentioned before, but um, when it comes to research, it's so personal to your circumstances and your particular project. So for me, for example, just taking my research projects, you know, I have some projects that can continue relatively undisturbed because there's this ability to use digital data sets um, or those data sets already exist or we can lean on aspects of industry sponsored data sets that we could just incorporate perhaps in a slightly different way than we anticipated. But there are other areas of my own research and obviously that's then also attached uh, to various different students as well where we literally cannot do anything because it requires us to go to in this case South Africa and go and measure some gases underground in a mine and we can't do that if we can't get there and even our collaborators in South African universities can't get to the mine site because going underground to do that sampling just isn't possible at the moment so there's this huge discrepancy just in my own portfolio of research according to what I can and cannot do and you see that play out with PhD students and postdocs as well so for example, you know, I have some PhD students who are working particularly in the lab. And so everything that everybody's previously described in terms of lab access is what's affecting them. Um, but then I also have a couple of students who work on machine learning uh, applications to bulk geochemical data sets across big bulk geochemical data sets. And, you know, one of those people is already in the process of finishing up and he's one of the, as we previously mentioned, he's kind of in a very fortunate position, not only because he's finishing up and can get an extension to his funding and, and is probably least effective in that sense, but also because he's doing something that's machine learning based. And so it's all digital and he, and he has full control. As long as he's got his laptop, he's fine. Um, I have another student who's just starting up a similar project based on a different data set, but it's, again, it's machine learning based. So for him, in terms of his future PhD, I'm not very worried because he's always going to be able to do it. He will always have the data, he will always have his laptop, and he'll always be able to do these, these sorts of analyses that he wants to do digitally. And there are other students who directly are impacted according to their lab. So as I say, there's this massive discrepancy, and this is really where individual, you know, on an individual basis, you have to think about people. And I think also there's a lot of, I think generally speaking in academia, there's a lot of focus on PhD students in terms of their funding their bursaries they can apply to through, again, learned societies, um, and how in particular the pandemic has affected them. And I think sometimes that comes at the cost of recognizing that there's a very similar range of issues that are affecting postdocs, whether they be postdoc research associates or postdoctoral fellows, um, but there's some kind of early career researcher who do not have a permanent tenure track position. And for them, publishing is, is their bread and butter. And you can only publish if you've got data. I think Irene said this already. And so if you're in a fortunate position where you have kind of a, a backlog of data that you can publish, then great, you're probably okay. Um, you're obviously gonna face the same challenges in terms of finding funding and, and moving on to your next role, et cetera, but you're probably okay. Whereas if you're in a pretty new postdoc in terms of new to you or in a new area of research that you've decided to go into, that's perhaps not related so closely to what you were doing at PhD, then you're in probably quite a tricky spot in terms of having access to the material and the data and therefore demonstrating that you can publish out of that and using that in your later career. So again, there's, there's a massive discrepancy and range of situations for individuals that I think we have to be mindful of. And again, I think in terms of um, just the opportunities that that provides, that we need to recognize that, that range in terms of what it will mean for those individuals in a year or even five years time, particularly if those individuals are looking then to go and find a permanent position, whether that be in industry or academia, because I think these can have some big implications. And I think that's recognized in certain sectors of our student cohort, but it's less talked about and less recognized globally, not just in the UK or at CSM here, but just less recognized for other members of our, of our university society. So yeah, that's, that's what I say. <laughs> we just need to be mindful of, uh, of individual circumstances, I think. And it's a real tricky one. You, there's no easy solution here. Right, yeah. Well, it sounds like it's, it's all right for all the people doing machine learning out there. 
But yeah, so with that being said, we're on to our last question. So I just want to remind our attendees to go ahead and submit any questions you have for our panelists. After this last uh, discussion question, we'll move into the Q&A session. So the last one is regarding uh, learning outcomes. So the question is, how has your university's administration and faculty learned from the pandemic? How about we get started with Irene? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we've all learned a lot. Um, I think one of the main things we've, we've learned is how diverse our students are and, you know, how different their lives are and how this, you know, touches and affects each individual on a different way. So I think at the beginning, the university was really confident that, you know, everybody had connectivity, everybody was okay. And you kind of like, get to a situation where you realize that that's not the case. You know, there are students that don't have connectivity or they live, you know, six people in a really small house and they can't turn on their camera or they can't turn on their mic because there's so much noise. And, you know, it's, and I think in that way, we've learned to be, you know, empathize more with our students. And I, and I think that's gonna maintain in time. Kind of like, you know, you get to understand in a more, in a closer way, how they, how they live. And the second, second thing that I think is it's good is that in a certain way, education has gotten more democratic with all of this because of all the online pre-record things. So I just, you know, think about if you're an undergrad student and you're um, interested in ore deposits or in economic geology, you just go into YouTube and there's so many talks now, so many presentations by really, really smart people, really good classes. You know, also the fact that we can, I can, you know, ask this person I know who is in, you know, I don't know, Japan, if they can give a talk about tsunamis, specialize on the topic, and they can give the talk to the class and the class can see it like on the screen live. I mean, that's amazing. And also kind of like thinking more about students, you know, some students are, you know, I think this is also a little bit more, it's more inclusive for students that live far away or that they can have any social issues that they don't want to go to class. You know, there's so much complexity in all, you know, us as humans that I think in that way, this whole pandemia and as we have been forced to move everything online has been able also to like open the door for other people to kind of like access um, knowledge and education. And especially at least in a country like here in Chile where, you know, university is very expensive. I think that's, that's important. It's important for people that they can access, you know, some kind of education, even if it's not, you know, in the conventional way we know. So I think, in, I mean, those things have been a very um, important lesson. And I think it could also, you know, be a game changer for how we move forward in terms of academia, research, and education. Great, thanks for sharing. Hannah, do you have any perspectives on this? Yeah, I agree with Irina. I think um, there is certainly some silver linings to come out of this. Um, and certainly uh, there's been a lot of lessons and a lot of learning that's gone on on both sides, whether that be from a student perspective or from a kind of teaching perspective, from a lecturer's perspective. Um, I think, yeah, we cannot make the assumption, um, we learned this rapidly, I think collectively, that everybody has the same uh, connectivity, the same laptop, or whatever, and they have the same lifestyle. And obviously that's not the case. And I think that's, that's probably a good thing in terms of highlighting that that's not the case. Um, I think when it comes to certainly things like field trips, um, that Actually, there's a lot of positives there, um, but perhaps in some cases, they just need a little bit more time to develop or to settle in and to just get it right. Because I think in terms of virtual field trip, it certainly is not something that can ever replace standing in the field and really looking at rocks. And the best geologist is the one that's seen the most rocks, right? Everybody says that. But for everybody else who isn't into field work or isn't in a position to go and do that, then that's not always true. And actually then, then becomes a little bit exclusive or almost elitist at times. So if you can provide a reasonable platform, it may not be 100% the same experience, but may provide other add-ons that, that you wouldn't be able to do in the field anyways, you know, in terms of virtual data sets or whatever, then actually you're in a really neat spot, I think, for the future um, in terms of making sure that people from all sorts of different backgrounds can go into geoscience, particularly economic ge geoscience, you know, economic geology, um, 
and that, that we can actually get lots of people involved. So, you know, for example, I mentioned it before, this, this underground mapping that I run, every year for several years, I've always had a very small proportion of my class say that they can't go underground for a whole bunch of reasons. Sometimes it's even things like claustrophobia. Sometimes it's because they physically can't do it. And sometimes it's because they wouldn't be able to see you very well underground. There's, there's a whole plethora of reasons. And now if we're in a position where perhaps we can leverage some funding or actually leverage some time to develop things properly, then we have the ability to create something that is so amazing in the future to actually be able to provide those people with as close a um, uh, a learning environment or the sort of intended learning outcomes that they would otherwise have got if they were underground than, than if none of this had ever happened. So as I say, I think there's some definites and positives there. In terms of learning outcomes, I think, yeah, definitely the main one is that not everybody has the same access to materials, to IT equipment, to connectivity, and also not everybody has the same resilience, shall we say, in terms of being able to stay on Zoom from nine till five or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's a really important take home. It's also important, I think, for students to have a, now, now that these things are starting to settle a little bit in terms of a continuous blended approach, perhaps in the future, that students themselves also see um, what has been developed and that it's not a poor substitution. I think we have to still demonstrate that. It's not a, it's not a poor substitution just because we have to do it. But actually, it's an enhancement. I think that's the positive that we need to highlight here because in most cases that I've come across, it really is a massive enhancement to what was previously there, albeit it's one that is rapidly developed. And because of that, may still need some revision and some improvement in places. Nonetheless, I think it's a positive step. Cheers. Yeah, I think you touched on a really important topic a few times here, especially regarding the virtual field trips where technology has become more uh, important in our field as far as getting data out to everybody else and information such as drone technology and other advanced advancements. I'm hoping uh, maybe we can touch on that in our discussion and our Q&A session a little bit later. Kata, how about you uh, share with us some learning outcomes from School of Mines, Colorado School of Mines? Yeah, I think there are definitely you know, things to take away from this time in the future. Um, but I do agree, it definitely highlighted the, the different circumstances of folks who are trying to participate in these you know, endeavors, whether it's uh, online learning or um, lab access. Yeah, we do now also do the remote instrumentation access, right? So, but, but we all have to understand, and maybe that wasn't as clear before, that not everybody has the same access to internet and you know, high-speed internet. Those are really things that need to be tackled by, by society in general, right? Um, so if we want to really in the future utilize this online tool as a tool to you know, level the playing field a little bit, you know, reduce costs because all of a sudden um, students or researchers or whoever, professionals don't have to travel across the world to, to expand their knowledge base, right? I mean, that, that, is, that is great. Um, maybe we also learned that we don't have to travel across the country to attend a two hour meeting. You know, a huge time saver. All of a sudden it is absolutely possible to, to attend this meeting uh, remotely. So I, I do think there, there are definitely things that you know, we should take away and um, really make things more accessible to the general public. All of a sudden uh, we can all listen to these great talks on YouTube, as it was mentioned before. We don't have to travel somewhere, you know, find a time where family commitments or other commitments, teaching, labs, and we don't have to spend a lot of you know, time and money. And then we have to spend money to actually attend a short course or so. You know, there's a huge opportunity that it can be made accessible to a much broader audience. However, we do have to as a society to figure out how we can make the make the internet and, and those contents accessible to everybody. That's a great point. We have talent all over the world. It'd be great if everybody had the same opportunity to share their input. Uh, how about uh, you go ahead and share us your perspective, Marie? Okay, again, I think a lot of it's been said, so I'll try and be brief. Um, I think the, the pandemic has actually has taught us a huge about 
I think it taught us how fast the world could change, which most of us didn't think was possible, but it did <laughs> very impressively, very quickly. There's a lot of great things that have come out of it in terms of education, in terms of how we have stepped up to something I think most of us as educators thought was coming, but was five years, decade away, and it was done in three months. Very impressive. I think there's also a lot of possibilities that we haven't yet taken advantage of in things like virtual field trips, um, in actually using the technology to the max um, to really do remote work on instruments. You know, so it's really truly remote as opposed to the way I think we're doing it now. Um, so I hope we keep exploring this because I think in six months, you know, as the as we start getting vaccinated. A lot of us are going to want to get as far away from this as we can, <laughs> right? I mean, we are, it's just, just human nature. So we need to take the good parts and keep them and keep pushing those boundaries and trying to see what we can really do with it. And then also from the pandemic, realize all the good stuff that we lost and how do we actually take the very best of that and maximize it, right? What is really good? And one that I suspect, and I'm as guilty here as anybody, that I have not learned during the pandemic and through Zoom is time bloody management. So like Katerina, I am more busy than I've ever been in my life. I spend more time in front of this damn screen that I hate to, I don't even want to admit. Um, I'm getting a lot done. I'm probably as productive as I have been almost any time in my career too, in many ways. But... <laughs> I know I could do it better and I, uh, you know, I need to figure out the time part of it, how that works. So that's something I, I hear from other people too. So I think there's other learnings we haven't, we haven't quite got there yet, right? Um, so I, I'm looking, I actually am looking forward to the next six months, six, eight months as we transition out. I think it's gonna be as big as, it's gonna be as big a challenge as going in. Um, but I think it could be really exciting if we do it the right way. So. Thanks, Isaac. Thank you. And actually, I think we have a great opportunity here with having you, Murray, because you can maybe talk about what has changed since your paper that you submitted with, uh, that you published with SCG Discovery back in July 2020 as a rapid response paper with the poll discussing or trying to observe how, how the mineral sector has, has been impacted by COVID. Uh, as, as your thoughts, have your thoughts changed at all since then? No, because I mean, we need to do another survey or somebody does, or we'll partner with somebody to do another one, you know, a rapid survey of, of where we are, I'd say in another couple of months, right? To see what's happened. I think the main thing I learned from that paper wasn't so much the data itself. Um, I had never done something like that where I, we went out to try and survey the world. I mean, the whole thought of it was just mind blowing, right? And, and there's actually one of the students that's on, I see on the, the list of uh, people that are attending, actually is the one who, who, without him knowing it, convinced me it was possible. And it was by trawling the web and looking for things that I would never have thought to look at as indicators of other things, right? So it's a machine learning type technology, if you will. That really blew my mind. Um, and so I think the main thing I actually learned from that paper, Isaac, wasn't any of the things about COVID itself. <laughs> it was actually the process of trying to think that through and, and putting that paper together with a bunch of students. None of us had ever tried to do something like this before. And in the process of two or three, well, four weeks doing it, right? It was just, it was, it was actually really neat. <laughs> um, just the process of doing it. I hope yeah, that makes some sort of sense. No, it absolutely does, especially seeing how many uh, respondents you're able to reach. I've, if I remember correctly, there's about oh, over 1,000 respondents from over yeah, around the world, countries. which is pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it so sounds like uh, maybe a new type of survey that should be capitalized on, maybe to get an understanding of the world's perspectives on certain things. It's just sort of bringing social science into geology, right? Again, it's integration of all sorts of different tools and all sorts of different ways of thinking and different things we should be doing. We should have been doing all the time anyway. 
Well, thanks for sharing that, Murray. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and go into our Q&A session. So we do have some questions from the audience. We have about 15 minutes left of the session. So let's go ahead and dive into them. We have a great question um, regarding grad student networks. So this person asked, since we can't network in person for now, how do you recommend grad students build networks remotely? Is there something we can do to make up for what we're missing as far as a grad school experience goes? Anybody who would like to chime in here is welcome to. Uh, Murray, you're um, muted. I'll, I'll jump in real fast and I'm sure the others will too. So, so the Ore Deposits Hub is a, for instance, I'm just gonna use that as an example, is a great networking tool for students and they developed it. And I've seen it already help with networking of grad students around the world. So to me, using virtual tools like that um, and coming up with it themselves. I mean, I think they've already been successful. Yeah, I'll jump in here as well. I think um, one of the things that I, I think we probably touched on when we were talking about this earlier was that um, by moving everything online, uh, whether it be in class or in a conference, you lack that physical networking with people. And so you lack the ability to say, you know, go and introduce yourself to somebody or bump into somebody or go for a coffee or a beer or whatever it might be. Um, so I think there's a level of anonymity associated with the fabulous, but nonetheless, all online conferences and uh, various groups and talks and stuff. So while there's so many positives out of that, I think there is this anonymity issue that needs to be dealt with. One thing I wonder is, I certainly get this when I'm teaching, is I'm faced with a wall of initials and blank spots. And I'm just, it feels like I'm speaking literally to the wall sometimes because there's no feedback. I can't see individuals. I can't see how they're responding. And, and frankly, with some of my year groups who are there for one year, I don't recognize their face and put a name to that face. I, I know who they are, but I wouldn't recognize them in the street because I don't see them regularly. Um, and so I think that comes onto this networking point because I think a lot of networking is knowing who the individual is somehow, whether that be recognizing them or otherwise. So one simple thing to think about is if you attend you know, a seminar, in your own institution when there's a speaker there um, or it's a sort of mini conference or something online or a workshop if it's appropriate and possible for you to do so put your camera on if you feel comfortable to do it and say hello and drop a message in the chat box and all of these things add up to people getting to know who you are and recognizing you i think it's very easy and i know i do it lots but to just kind of sit in slightly anonymous meetings you know maybe staff meetings with the camera off the microphone off and I'll just chip in when I need to and you know that's fine for staff meetings they know who I am and vice versa but if you're trying to network it's probably not the best thing right so I think just be mindful of that if it's possible for you to do that then maybe that's a, a very simple thing to do but possibly quite a useful thing to do yeah I I absolutely agree with Hannah especially um I mean it's not networking but when you're teaching and all the cameras are off like, I, I don't know who my students are. <laughs> and maybe the two students that actually turn on their camera, I, I do know who they are. I tend to listen to them more sometimes because, you know, I can see them. And I think the same thing happen for, happens for meetings or, you know, networking events or, you know, even if they are online, just being able to recognize the face of the other person is going to be beneficial for the future, like in terms of networking. Because someday we're going to go back to conferences and you will be able to recognize the person that was with you in whatever meeting you were attending. Because if you can't see your face, it's very, you know, difficult to remember that person. So no, I absolutely agree with Hannah. I think that's a very, a very important part. Um, and the other thing I, I think is to keep on pushing for more events, you know. Um, I know, for example, in terms of the lab where I work, which is pretty big, we, we still have meetings every other week and sometimes we don't even discuss science. We just sit down and talk, everybody talks about how their week has been and how they're doing. So I think it's also important to kind of like push for those, um, you know, those common places where even if it is online, we just get to talk for a while and, you know, maybe even have a beer with your um, lab mates or with whatever with a networking event and I mean it's it's the best thing we could do right now 
understanding how the situation is. And I think it's also, you know, it's an effort that we can make in order to not lose that networking part of our, you know, of our professional life that is so important. All right, thank you all for that. We have another question here. Uh, Murray answered it in a comment. So if you can maybe speak on that. The question is, what specifically could some of the learned organizations out there, such as SEG, do to improve the experiences and situations of students and researchers during this time? What, what new or innovative offerings or ideas do the panelists see as being the most beneficial in bridging some of these challenging gaps that have been discussed? So Murray, you, you answered this in the comments. Right, I did, and, and I, I, I apologize to everyone and to the panelists. I didn't know by answering it that way, it would go poof. Um, so I'll give you my answer and then the other panelists can think about it. Mine was um, the SUG student chapters are already in existing groups of, of graduate students together. Why don't they have a contest for a virtual field trip us uh, submitted you know, a digital field trip? And, and to me, a field trip could be, you know, think, thought about in many ways. It could be a classic field trip to an open pit, to a locality. It could be a field trip through a suite of samples that someone happens to have sitting on their desk. It could be a field trip through a piece of core to actually really go through it in multiple detail. It could be a thin section through a quem scan image or a thin section. But all could be field trips in different ways, right? So, so think broadly, but I think it'd be fascinating to see from around the world, you know, for, for a decent prize. So Brian Hole and Diane, if you're, you know, if you're listening, what would it be? Um, but, you know, a good prize to get a great field trip series of videos. Thanks, Isaac. I think uh, from my perspective, and apologies if I've dived in in front of the arena or Kata, but I think this boils into two, down to two categories. Um, one is around funding and one is around similar events to this or, or online conferences. I'll deal with the latter first. So I think, you know, there's an example here in the UK, we have the Mineral Deposit Studies Group. And so that is, you know, partly to do with the JOLSOC and partly through the, the Mineralogical Society. But there's this MDSG conference every winter of every year. And through that, you, you network. So PhD students, go to if you're anything close to economic geology you, you go to that that's the thing to be seen at then we also get master's students going and sometimes several undergraduates as well so that's an opportunity for them to network but this year the mdsg has decided to host its conference entirely online and so because of that there's been a bit of a change of format in terms of how talks are presented and uh, and whatnot because obviously a poster session is going to be tricky but nonetheless they're doing it and I think that's really important and really impressive and it's a really great opportunity for people to join in perhaps people also who wouldn't have been able to go to that normally because it's it's quite a UK and Ireland centric thing um, in terms of when it is hosted specifically around people being around at Christmas and New Year and being able to go to this conference so I think one thing whether it be the Geological Society and Mineralogical Society in the UK case here and, and Ireland or whether it be you know SVG or, or whatever, is to put more um, webinar workshop type events on that are virtual that highlight early career research science. And I know there's been several of these, including through the SCG, but I think they're really valuable because again, going back to that first point of networking, that enables people to network. And I think that's the thing that we're in danger of, of starving out of or, 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 or somehow you know getting in the way of in terms of making that effective. So that's, that's one. The other thing is around funding, and I think I touched on this earlier. Of course, there's a whole range of fantastic bursaries and scholarships and all sorts of extra funding that students can apply to and early career researchers can apply to, and that gets them effectively extra bonus and you know bonus points and, and brownie points and kudos on their, on their CVs and their resumes and, and helps them down the line. And the problem with that is uptake, because they tend to be focused towards a specific thing that the student has applied for, particularly field trips, I find. And, and obviously, they, 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 that's not going to be possible. And so there's some uncertainty around that. So on the one hand, you know, uh, the funders, the learning societies may be a little bit cautious about who they award to um, uh, in terms of the viability of the project in light of COVID. And on, the, on the other hand, students may also be a bit reticent to apply 
on the basis of what's the point? You know, I've applied to some field funds, but I'm probably not going to be able to use them. What's the point? And, and so that money then effectively, you know, it doesn't, the money itself is one thing, which I'm sure the learning society is worried about, but the students are probably less concerned about because I think the biggest winner from a student perspective is that kudos, is that ability to add it to your CV and use that in future in terms of I applied for these funds and I won them and I use them and I've done this on a competitive basis. So I think, you know, whether it be a continuation of what learning societies are already doing or even a bolstering of it, and that is to encourage application of bursaries and scholarships. And if that means loosening the criteria associated with certain bursaries or scholarships that students can apply to, you know, if it's traditionally a field trip based thing, why not say, okay, it could be a virtual field trip based thing in terms of developing some virtual platform as a student towards your research project. Or if it's a lab based thing, you say again, a little bit more flexibility around how that's carried out or when it's carried out. And then that, basically that messaging that you're still open for business, it's still important that you apply for these things uh, and that they are still awarded, even if there's a slight change in terms of how they're spent or when they're spent. So I think those are the two things I would highlight there. It's a good question though. I'd like to say something as well. So um, general uncertainty right now is, is, is a huge issue, right? And, whether you look at it from yeah whatever perspective you're looking at it because now we're obviously we would usually be in the in that time frame thinking about next year's field work and what to do and if the if field work is possible we don't want to miss out on it on the flip side we don't know whether it's possible so all around uncertainty right is, is an issue and it's also emotionally draining for for faculty and for students because we don't know so Yes, more flexibility around how uh, we plan is definitely absolutely warranted, whether it's the plan or whether it's it's applying for funding. It's it is just the situation that it is. And maybe that's how it's going to be in the future that we just have to be more aware of a plan B or a plan A and a plan B, right? So that is definitely something we all should bear in mind and maybe implement in some of these uh, you know, supported funding opportunities. The other thing in terms of networking, I just want to say uh, one last thing about that as well. I find it personally sometimes difficult to really put online events in my calendar and to follow up and follow through because there's always something you know, pressing to do. And on, you know, we all kind of understand. So, on the flip side, it's really important to continue to engage with the community. So I really encourage everybody to look up those events. And obviously, everybody who is on this in this panel right now or in this in this uh, Zoom call, uh, that's obviously not a huge problem. But yeah, these these uh, or deposit hub presentations, yeah, put them in your calendar. Um, send a message to the presenter, maybe follow next time there's another uh, opportunity follow up. Hey, I really enjoyed your last talk. Yeah, follow up with a question. And hopefully soon we can be in person, at least you know, partially in person. Hopefully things will slowly move back to normal. Don't be afraid to walk up to a person and say like, hey, I really uh, enjoyed your presentation on XYZ uh, that you gave, you know, but just follow up, you know, build, establish the, the, the connection and then follow up. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks for all providing your perspectives. That's, that's would conclude our session actually, because now we're at time. So I just want to take the time to thank all our panelists for sharing all of their thoughts and for their time. Attendees, thank you all for coming and we'll catch you at the next SCG event. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks, all Thank the panelists. You. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Isaac. all the attendees, too. <laughs>